Hi, my name is Amberly Jones. Um, I am a former interpreter at the Department of Access Services, um, and I am currently in an advanced degree. So today, I don't really want to follow the prompt that's here. I would like to talk about the history of interpreters of color on RIT campus, because I think it's really important to document it. Um, we're often in the background. Um, we try to make communication seamless as a natural part of the way humans connect, right? So we don't often talk about our own experiences within um, a field, within RIT, et cetera. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I like to talk about. And it leads directly into something that I've been involved with called the Random Program. All right, so I guess I'll start with my experience as a ASLIE student. So I'm an alumni, I graduated in 2012. Um, and when I graduated, there was one other student of color in my class. Uh, on average, maybe one, maybe two if we're lucky every single year. So, you know, understanding that a huge portion of NTID are actually identified as POC. So currently in 2023, 49 to 50% of all students at NTID identify as people. But there is a huge struggle to recruit and retain interpreters of color into the field of interpreting. So when I graduated, I was an anomaly, I was a uniform. Um, so I worked K through 12 and I decided to come back to DAS, the Department of Access Services back in 2014. Um, I feel as though that was really, um, important time to come back you know look, looking back I didn't realize the enormity of the moment but in spring of 2015 uh, NTID actually had a protest there is a protest um, you know the students it was the Ebony Club and the Communication Access Now um, organization came together to look at the diversity statistics at NTID. They, through that, they learned that there was not enough representation, both in administration, faculty, and staff uh, to match the population that they serve. So uh, they said, we want something to do this, about this. And Jerry Buckley, um, you know, really listened to the students. He took it to her and he said, you know, I, I, I want to do something about this. You're right, it is a problem and it is a spot in which we have overlooked for far too long. So he actually contacted Dr. Rita, uh, Rico Peterson, who then uh, also worked with Angela Hauser to, you know, ask them, what can you do about increasing recruitment and retainment of interpreters of color into the field of interpreting? Um, so that's how the department, uh, was a DOC, the Department Outreach Committee got started. <laughs> it was the four founders, which is Darren Larson, Dee Herrera, uh, Christy Love, and then um, Angela Hauser. So they got together. It started out as an internal organization for the Department of Access Services to help support the retainment and you know, interpreters of color inside the Department of Access Services. We would have monthly meetings in which we'd invite the community to come, we'd hang out, we talk about different issues. They also went to K through 12, help inspire um, students of color to get into the interpreting field as a career aspiration. And I think that was really important for me because at the time in the department of 140 interpreters, there was eight interpreters of color. I believe. Um, so there, there just wasn't many of us. And I was the newest interpreter of color. So I'm not saying I was the experimental child, but you know, I got the benefit from all of the outreach and programs that they started to put in. And, and because of the feedback and how I was able to advance, um, you know, it, it gave them an idea of where they wanted to go for the future. So uh, it, it's kind of cool because Christy was the first interpreter of color I saw on stage doing a high visibility event. Um, there was Darren, who was the first interpreter of color that I ever met, right? And he's also a black man in the interpreting field, which is very rare. Um, D, who was in all of my clubs, all of my events. So she was very much a face that I saw very often. And then um, Angela became my mentor to help me advance in the interpreting field and really hone my craft. Okay, so I was able to um, 
see all of them as they start to move up into leadership. Uh, the other person that I need to mention is Valerie Randleman, who was the first interpreter of color, the first Black woman hired into the Department of Access Services. So she had a wonderful knack. And I do want to say she's still alive. She's living in Ohio. So when I say was, it's because she retired. Um, but she had a wonderful knack for adopting all the interpreters of color um, within the department to make us feel welcome. She also had a wonderful way of having honest conversations with people that called them in instead of pushing people away. Okay, so those are very important people just in my career and many other people's career. So back to the random program. Uh, as you know, Valerie Randleman, Randleman program, the connection. Uh, so what happened was, um, you know, after they started doing this, they realized that they were trying to solve very broad systematic issues. Um, and it was really hard because you need to focus on what's important and where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. Um, so they made the hard decision of having to slow down their work with the DOC and to create the random and program, which started out as a two-year uh, internship, we call it a preceptorship, uh, within the Department of Access Services to invite interpreters of color to you know, study here at DAS as a working interpreter. So that was really good. It was also really hard to establish because we had to change the culture of the Department of Access Services. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of us, before the random and program was established, a lot of us felt, you know, we, we love our affinity much, but it's also exhausting. Um, sometimes you are set out and expected to interpret an event in which you would rather participate in. You want to find those spaces of, for example, Black joy, but you can't because you're expected to be an interpreter in that role and to take off you know, your own personality, your own thoughts, et cetera, to interpret, to provide access for also a community that, that has just as much of a right to be there as well. And representation is important. So it's that constant battle within yourself. Um, so yeah, we were overworked and really tired, et cetera. So we were really happy that the Renaman program was being established. Um, so yes, the Renaman program was established in January of 2019. And knowing the history now, looking back, we know why 2019, 2020 has been interesting. Um, so January of 2019. I joined the Random and Program in January or July of 2019. So I was not a founder, but I joined within six months. The reason I joined is because Angela Hauser was then hired to become our first Black manager within the Department of Access Services. So we're really excited. And she approached me and said, hey, would you like to take my spot as a mentor or a preceptor within the um, the random and program. Uh, and I just I just want to say that the random and program was named after Valerie Random. And that's because she was retiring that year. And the founders thought it would be an amazing opportunity to honor all of the work and all of the battles and all of the rooms that she made for us within the Department of Access Services. That is who it was named after. Anyways. So Angela approached me and said, hey, would you like to join the Random and Program? And I said, yes, but also you have very big shoes to fill. You were my mentor and it's an honor, but I am terrified, right? To have these very hard discussions, you know that you're going to get a lot of resistance. You're going to have people who ask, um, why do we need a random program? We already have an apprenticeship program or why do they need their own space or why is it important or is this affirmative action and, and all of those things. And it's, it's this pressure to constantly be on and have the right answer, the appropriate answer. Um, so I said yes because I like pain. No, because I, I said yes because I thought it's the right thing to do. So I joined and that started my journey with the random program. Um, at the time, Darren Larson actually left because he wanted to pursue another career, another passion of him in ministry, and we were really excited, so, but that left Christy Love, uh, Dihara, and me. So we got together, and it was kind of a 
opportunity to redefine the random program. So we came up with the um, mission and the vision, which is to recruit and retain interpreters of color into the field of interpreting. That's our vision and our mission is to create a protege led pathway program uh, that has DEI as a core value. Okay, um, so that's kind of where everything stems from. We created four pillars in which our program will be based on, was based on, and still is based on. So it started out with interpreting. So we view interpreting, a lot of people, when they give feedback for interpreting, it will often be, you know, people will often say, oh, that was good, or that wasn't good, or I did this fine, et cetera, without any context. And it can often feel evaluative, evaluative, evaluative towards the interpreter themselves instead of looking at the product. So we actually use something called the integrated model of interpreting which allows interpreters to understand their own mental process and explain and understand the reasons why they made a linguistic choice. Okay, so here is a really good example. So let's say there is a Black History Month in which I was interpreting a Black woman and I was teamed with a white woman, okay? The speaker themselves is a Black person or a Black woman. Suppose they were talking about the Black community. I, as a Black woman, would sign Black, black which is very, it's a cultural sign, okay? And me as a Black woman, it's very appropriate for me to be able to sign that. If I was a white interpreter, that is not appropriate for them to sign. They'd have to go Black, okay? So the point is, while evaluating that or while sitting down and gathering feedback, by knowing why you made those decisions to say black instead of black, whether it's a filter or it's a conscious choice, or maybe you say, you know what, it was not a conscious choice. Thank you for pointing that out. You're able to have a better control over your own linguistic choices while interpreting. And we found that that actually has helped a lot of interpreters of color because we, we value the language that people bring. So that's how we evaluate interpreting. So it's the practice of interpreting in the practice of using the integrated model of interpreting where I am I. That's our first pillar. Our second pillar is actually um, language. So we've often found that in interpreting programs that people come from, not all language is valued equally, unfortunately. So that means the language that you might grow up with is not valued in the academic setting, which is inappropriate in our philosophy. So what we do is we create, you know, we, we honor and hone and practice if you're trilingual we work in a trilingual setting. We do things like create a working thesaurus. So if someone says, that's cool, we write down different definitions, both in sign language and in whatever language you'd like to use in that time for that's cool. So you could say, that's cool, that's dope. You could say, that's splendid, right? So, so we give the wide range of linguistic use that people use in everyday life and everyday settings, depending on how comfortable they are in that area or what's appropriate to use it. So we respect all language equally. Uh, the next was the EI, which was my personal favorite. I helped create that pillar myself. Um, and it came out of frustration, to be honest. Um, you know, because this is the iPad archive, got to be truthful here. And the reason it came out of frustration is because I've often felt that DEI initiatives are catered towards white audiences, that it depends on the experiences and the traumas of the marginalized groups in that setting to share, to shock the humanity into the non-marginalized people, right? And that's a really hard place to live, that if I am forced and required to do diversity training, I'm constantly giving my emotional labor to people who might not value it and sometimes might use it as a tool or a weapon against me later or use it as a weapon against someone else, right? So DEI spaces, I felt, are not always safe for the people that go. Um, so that's where it came out of that frustration of like, wow, I'm going to another event in which I have to give a lot. Um, and I think that a lot of even well-meaning people don't understand that interpreters of color are often graduating from their interpretive programs, trying to figure out 
what it means to be, for example, Black or a person of color in a predominantly white field. So when meaning people come up to us and ask us, how would I sign this? How would I do this? Like we're trying to work on our craft. We haven't even figured out our identity yet, right? And it, it there's a pressure to have the perfect answer. So I created the DEI pillar as a way to have authentic conversations amongst ourselves. So we are allowed to have those nuances, right? Without a white gaze on us and say, you know what, this is how I feel about colorism, or this is how I feel about care, or these are the traumas that I've experienced that I feel like I don't want to continue for the next generation, right? Things that aren't necessarily safe to share in the wider world. Um, so it's actually protege led. So our interns come and then they pick the topics that they want to lead. And then they share what they've found, whether it's their own experiences. And it, it creates an opportunity of vulnerability amongst the people of color ourselves. Right. And it, in turn, people learn helping mechanisms in leadership, et cetera. So when in the future, when people come up and ask opinions, there's already an answer. There's already, it's already been practiced. So that is where that came from. Uh, last is professional development. They have access to all the professional development that DAS offers, but then we also add our own flair to it. So for example, currently there is a trend in the interpreting field to create something called e-portfolios. We already know that there is name bias in resumes. So what happens when your product is out there and people can see your face as a black and brown signer? Like, what, what do you do about that? Because it's now expected for the field, but then people see who you are and there's a bias automatically against you. We also teach things. I personally teach um, financial fitness and I cater it towards communities of color. So often interpreters are freelancers or contractors. So they do their own taxes. They're not necessarily employed like the staff of our ATO. So I teach things like how to plan for a multi-generational household, um, how to get out of the, uh, the minimum payment trap, things like that. I talk about things like redlining and how it affects our community. Um, so that's kind of the four pillars of the random and program. So 2019 continued to go. Um, so that was the 19, 20, 20 years when I was the professor. Um, and it went well until the pandemic happened. And to be honest, um, it was a moment of panic for all of us. I mean, not just the pandemic, but you know what to expect, and there were people dying, and people were getting sick. Like, in addition to that, we were concerned because we felt as though we were about to lose a generation of interpreters of color. Um, our program at the time only had two, three people. It was not, it was not big. Um, and because we just didn't have the capacity in the leadership for the number of people applying yet, we weren't well known. Uh, so what ended up happening was we said, what can we do? We're about to lose a generation of interpreters of color because, you know, people are losing their jobs, they're losing their internships, and black and brown people don't have the same network that our white peers do. Um, we we're, were really worried. People are really isolated, et cetera. So, um, we came up and we said, hey, let's create a summer intensive program. And I laugh because it got really big. Um, we originally created it for eight people. And we did not think we were going to get eight applications. We were nobody, right? Like we had less than like 500 followers on Facebook. Like we didn't have like a social media presence or anything like that. And we... Um, created the summer intensive program. It was a five-week program. We were going to mentor and you know have our four pillars. It was going to be held in all on Zoom. We actually reached out to a few ASLIE students to say, hey, we we're thinking about doing this. Do you want to be in the first cohort just to give us feedback to try it out? So I believe there are two or three ASLIE students that applied. So really we had five, six opportunities left. Um, so I was the social media manager at the time. So I created this post to say, hey, we're creating the summer intensive program. If you're interested, please apply. So it went viral, and I, and I say viral because small small program, but we had, I believe when we checked it two hours later, we had 20,000 engagements. We had hundreds of shares, thousands of likes and comments and interactions, and it was, it was a lot. It was a lot. We had, I believe, 
75-ish applications in the first two hours of it being posted. And you have to understand, we had like, what, six slots max? So we panicked and we set up another post, like, thank you so much, we can't accept anymore. <laughs> so we did that and then we decided to up the max to 16 participants. Right, so it went from eight to 16. Um, so all of us would take one form. At the time, in the spring, summertime, we added Emilio. Um, so he is absolutely amazing, another Latino interpreter in the Department of Access Services. So there's four of us at the time. So we each um, accepted four mentees each, which is a lot. And that summer is when George Floyd was murdered. Um, so there was a lot of, it, it was a moment that we all were able to get together. You know, we were doing the summer intensive program. We were practicing all of the things, our four pillars. And I believe it was the second or the third week in which that he was murdered. Um, and I remember Christy Love Cooper, you know, we had talked about this before, but she announced she's like, we're, today we're not going to do IMI. We're, you know, I'd like to do a pulse check to see how everyone's doing and feeling. And I remember that being the first time in which a black person was murdered and I didn't have to mask. I did not need to show up at work and pretend like everything was okay. And I remember the participants also feeling that way. There was emotions, there was crying, et cetera. And, you know, that ability to just let go and not be hard anymore and not pretend like it didn't affect us, not pretend like, you know, when people say, are you okay? We're like, oh, we're fine. And then we're fine. Right. So, and that's when I knew that we really had something special here. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And one of the things that I kept hearing that really frustrated me was the barrier for interpreters of color to get certification. So often in many states, you're unable to lift up your hands to interpret legally without some type of basic licensure or certification. The problem is that it's really expensive. And I believe at the time it had a 27% pass rate. Um, so it's about $500 per test with a 27% pass rate. It's not necessarily the same. And if you look at our populations, we tend to be non-traditional students, we tend to have families, we tend to have to take on more student loans, come from less affluent backgrounds, etc. We often are working two jobs to both support ourselves through college as well as after college, right? So often what I kept hearing is I've been saving up for this, but I didn't pass and now I'm stuck. And the more you don't use a language, the more you lose it, right? So something that I kept hearing again and again and again, and it was, it was really frustrating me. <laughs> so I went to the other four and I said, hey, I know it's a global pandemic and the you know, economy is crashing and everything, but can we fundraise for a spell <laughs> And the other four, they were like, okay, Amber, go for it. If you want to try to do this, go for it. So I, I met with Brian Hensel, um, who is the uh, executive director of the Office of External Affairs at NTID. Um, and you know, our goal was to fundraise twenty-five thousand dollars in three years. Now I do not have twenty-five thousand dollars in three years, at least not the time. Maybe one day, but not at the time. Um, and he said, you know, I think we can do this. And the thing about NTIDs and endowments are they, they are matched dollar for dollar by the federal government. So that means if you were able to hit the $25,000 in one year or in three years, it'd be officially endowed and it would be established forever. So that means students, um, alumni of the randomman program would always be able to access that, those funds to be able to obtain certification, right? It's like, okay, cool. So our first ask, you know, I met with Michael Brizzolo, who is also an alumni of NTID. He is the CEO and founder of Interpretech, which is right down the street on Film Street. Um, so I met with him and I said, please give us money. <laughs> and I remember walking away, like he's probably just going to give me go away money, maybe $5,000 max. Um, and he contacted me, he's like, you know, I really believe in this cause. I actually am I'm friends with Valerie Randleman. I love to see her legacy continue. How about this? I am willing to give you up to $25,000 for a match-to-match -match challenge. So that means 
every one dollar that you raise i'll match for it to become two dollars and then the federal government will match it to become four dollars so that means every dollar that was donated would then become four dollars um, so that just gave me some motivation because it was an absolute honor for him to be able and willing to do that so after one year of really hustling and fundraising, we were able to raise $100,000 for interpreters of color to obtain certification. So it's the random endowment for interpreters of color. So it was such a blessing. It was such an honor to be able to do that. So the money is actually invested in an account. 2% um, is always given back to keep up with inflation, normal inflation. <laughs> and then um, whatever grows becomes what we delegate out to on the alumni of a random program. And the way we're able to set up um, really gives me joy. So we put a priority list. So the first are the um, the first people who can get it is all of the alumni of the random program. So that includes the two-year preceptorship, that includes the summer intensive program, and whatever future endowment or uh, programs that we create. Right. So they would all be able to access the money. But let's say everyone from the first pool of people, um, you know, whoever wants to be certified, is able to obtain certification, which is a good problem to have. I would absolutely love that. The second would go to an ASLIE student of color that wanted to get certification. So that means the money will never sit there and it will always be helping interpreters of color. So that's been a big moment of pride for me. The Random and Program has grown so much. We welcome about six people every single year and maybe more if we continue to grow. We have been doing the summer intensive program. It's now going into our fourth year of the summer intensive program this summer, 2023 will be the fourth year. Um, and it's just, it's been great. I have my own family tree of the people that I mentored who then became mentors and successors and it just keeps on growing. And I know that my legacy has been passed on and kept. And it doesn't mean that my, the people who learned from me and learned with me have to do everything the exact same thing I did, but it's been such a pleasure watching them lead in their own way. We're now doing workshop series uh, in which interpreters of color all over the nation have been signing up for. <laughs> They've been going viral again and again and again and have several thousand engagements every time you post something, um, which has been really cool. We, we are changing the field of interpreting. And that's true. I hope that it continues to grow in the future. Um, not I hope, it will continue to grow in the future. We're doing a lot. And I would say the culture of Department of Access Services has really changed. We went from eight of us at 140 to about 30 of us. That's where we are. And, and that means during affinity months, it's not the same people being assigned for every single event. There's now the ability to have rotation, to pick the things that give us joy and be able to participate sometimes. So that is the, the beauty of, you know, investing in diverse programs and, and having the people that you can trust um, to be allies and complicit in that. All right, so thank you so much. That's the history of the Random Program. And that was needed. I was needed.